Ladies and gentlemen, let's get into the video. We're going to be discussing PlayStation VR. There is a hell of a lot of excitement surrounding PlayStation virtual reality, and indeed, not just PlayStation virtual reality, more precisely, virtual reality as a whole is going to be a massive part of gaming. Pretty much anyone in the known is talking about that, whether it's John Carmack, whether it's Sony. Everyone knows that virtual reality over the next couple of years is going to be emerging as the next big thing for gaming. Virtual reality for the PlayStation, however, started life apparently in 2010, late 2010, and the project um, was designed along with the PlayStation 4. In fact, the PS4, it confirmed once again, it, we had already heard about this earlier this year, but it was once again reiterated in an interview, that, which we linked in the video's description, that the PS4 uh, was designed from the ground up with virtual reality in mind. A really interesting factor, however, with the PlayStation VR is the screen. There was a lot of concern regarding how virtual reality would work on a console. For example, if you were to take a look at uh, Oculus Rift or HTC Vive, those type of things, they have an awful lot of horsepower which is driving them. For example, with the Oculus Rift, you can have two R9 290Xs, just for the sake of argument, powering the actual screen so you'd have one GPU per screen if you were to utilize let's say AMD's liquid VR technology in other words a hell of a lot of performance moreover the screens themselves generally have a slightly higher resolution and that was a big concern before anyone got hands on the kit there was an awful lot of comments saying well yeah you know it could be cool but what's actually gonna happen you know with the image quality now uh, an awful lot of concern with that but now people have started to say what the the PlayStation VR has probably one of the best quality screens out there what gives like why is that and um, in the interview Sony's Dr. Richard Marks said the following not every 1080p screen is the same ours has three sub pixels per pixel which means true RGB for every pixels some of the other displays don't actually have full RGB for every pixel, so they have less sub-pixels per pixel. And the, play, and the frame rate excuse me, of PlayStation VR is also very high. But probably the biggest effect is the optics. The designers have done a really good job at matching the optics to the field of view to the screen. Remember, it's not just Sony themselves who are singing praises when it comes to their virtual reality solution. For example, the former technical director of Rockstar Games, his name would be Blair, Renewed. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Anyway, he is now the CEO of Iris VR. He even said that the PlayStation VR is on, and I quote, in a league of its own and not really in competition with other VR companies. There's a huge install base, solid consumer experience, and single target for developers, and they, he thinks that it's going to do really well. Another one of, well, one of the biggest rumors surrounding the PlayStation VR when it was first announced is what's going to happen in terms of the performance of the hardware and so immediately most people assumed that there would be some kind of upgrade unit and when we heard about the breakout box let's just call it that for the sake of argument we immediately assumed that there would be some type of gpu in there or some type of accelerator processor which would potentially increase the performance of the PlayStation 4. In a nutshell, it would work in tandem with the PS4 to increase the performance. That doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, Richard Marks, once again, uh, was rather helpful in this, and he said that the breakout box, first of all, one of the jobs it does is to take the video, the display, from the PS4 and split it. The box, I guess you could say, DVRs the display. So the way he explains it is rather simple. The PS4 gets the the data, the image ready for the virtual reality display, and then the warping or what have you is, which was done to the image is then removed and then sent to the regular TV so that other people can see what the hell you're doing, which is kind of a smart way to do it. The breakout box also handles the system's 3D audio, which is obviously another really big factor when it comes to virtual reality. After all, there's no point having, you know, immersive 3D visuals if you don't have the 3D sound to go along with it. Plus, it takes sensor data from the actual headset itself and then converts that into a signal that the PlayStation 4 can understand and then use that, of course, for controlling the game. 
Finally, on the subject of performance, because obviously that's kind of a big deal, the screen itself can handle up to 120 uh, hertz, but there is support, of course, for 60 and 90. Now, at the end of the day, it really does depend on how the developers themselves want to utilize that frame time in the GPU. Pretty much the same as the 2D display, if you do want to shoot for, say, 60 frames per second rather than 120, in which case you've got double the amount of time to render each frame of animation. Although that they do offer the developers what is known as reprojection, which does take it from 60 frames per second up to 120, which is probably one of the more crucial elements of making virtual reality smooth. Now, it's also known on PC elements, and it is on PC, uh, very much like on the Morpheus, the Orchid's Rift, and so on. It's known as asynchronous time warp. Now, as many of you know, in an ideal world, if you've got, let's say, a 60 FPS display, every single refresh, so let's say the screen refreshes 60 times per second, for every one of those, you will get a new frame of animation. So, in the sense, it's queued up. So one, one frame finishes, another frame's ready, and so on and so on. And this would, of course, naturally include 90 frames per second, 120, 144. But to do that, once again, to reiterate, it does require less, well, it does automatically mean you have less GPU time to render each frame of animation, or with less milliseconds to draw each frame. So what reprojection does is it maps the previous frame uh, based on the latest motion coordinates available from the HMD. Now, he did finally admit once again that just because of all of this technology, developers at the end of the day will still have to make concessions and have to figure out, you know, I have to shoot for a minimum of 60 FPS. So what do I do? Um, you know, uh, there's going to have to be some problems. Now, they do recommend high levels of geometry because, let's face it, if you start seeing really janky, ugly, low polygon type of texture, uh, I'm sorry, objects, you're probably going to immediately notice that. And same with even things such as low resolution textures. There's very little as, as immersion breaking, but you might have to crank down the amount of real-time shadows, the amount of lighting, you might have to reduce the amount of anti-aliasing, you might have to do a dozen different things, maybe reduce the, um, let's say, the distance you can see stuff, like have perhaps a harsher level of detail at a distance, whatever you need to do, maybe reduce the amount of enemies on screen to reduce the amount of pain, I guess you could say, on the GPU. It's pretty, it's pretty simple, but it's also very important stuff to remember because that is possibly going to have an impact on the system's life, as in, you know, what the maximum they can really push out of it. I've got to say, though, <clears throat> I'm kind of looking forward to it. It's going to be very interesting to see what games they manage to push on it, what the technology is truly capable of. Of course, the main concern for many is the pricing and just what games are going to be uh, VR compatible, and ultimately, is it going to be a gimmick on consoles? I don't think so. I think they're going to have a pretty good consistent amount of... Um, I think they're going to have a pretty good consistent amount of support, if I'm totally honest. I do have concerns in the long run, but I think I think they're setting the groundwork, and this is what even Shuhai himself said. He said, you know, it's all kind of... It's all very early. It's like when the PlayStation 1 first came to the scene and the Sega Saturn, the N64, we all remember the problems with the N64, with the fogging. And yes, there were techniques to get around the fogging, but at the end of the day, those techniques led to other concessions. Or with the PlayStation, you had really janky geometry in some instances, or problems with, let's say, uh, texture warping. Or on the Sega Saturn, you had problems, of course, with... Uh, I think it was fog, if memory serves. I think it was real-time fogging had some real problems. There were, once again, techniques around that. Gord shading, same thing. They could use software techniques, but it, it... Basically, what I'm saying to you in many different words is that, you know, you could see the backland geometry was a really major factor, and the amount of memory, you know, the fill rates, it just wasn't high enough for high-quality textures, and, of course, lighting back then, you were lucky to have just real-time colored lighting at all. Uh, say, for example, Quake 2 back in the day when we saw it on the PC, which happened to come in around, I guess, the PS1 era. 
If you notice, there was some coloured lighting there, like for example if you were using the blaster and then you were to pew a few times, if you don't have Quake 2 or, you know, whatever, you can check out the video we've got on it, slash segue, slash marketing of own channel, slash slash, uh, on our channel, and for real, you can actually see there's some early implementations of lighting, for example, once again, if you use the blaster, you can see the uh, illumination of the laser bolt, or whatever, the energy bolt, let's call it, as it shoots down the corridor, but they didn't do that with too much stuff, for example, they didn't have uh, too many torches on the, on the um, sides of the walls, or maybe have darker darker sections and that type of stuff and it could have been really interesting how they how they leveraged it but because the gpus back then weren't powerful enough and because they were still trying to get used to it and even mentally my point being and i've kind of gone around this, the mulberry bush here the point being that it was really early stuff and as it migrated to the playstation 2 very early ps2 games there were some that looked pretty damn good like for example tech and tag tournament looked pretty good or Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast looked really good, but if you look at them now, or even compared to the later generation of the PS2, you can definitely see some problems with the, the lighting, for example. The lighting, the textures, they look rather flat. And it's just kind of how it is. So, I do think that this is a good solid base. But, what's going to happen over the next few years on the PlayStation 5, the Xbox, whatever the hell? Only you can guess. Anyway. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.